Good morning, good morning. So great to be with you this morning. I want to share with you the gospel of grace, the gospel that I believe God wants to, to engulf the whole earth with so that everyone would hear this amazing good news. We've got to discover the heart of Abba. And I want you to, I want you to, to look through a window this morning and see the heart of the Father for you and for all humanity. It is God's desire for the entire world to hear this gospel that is able to transform all people, transform all people and all things. This gospel has the power of God to transform all things. He wants you to experience the same kind of life that he's experiencing. It's called Zoe life. It's called a life that is an eternal life, a the highest quality of life. That's the life that God wants for you. God doesn't want you to struggle. God, God doesn't want you to go through stuff. Although we go through stuff, we know that even in those stuff, we are more than conquerors. Why? Because we have Zoe life. We have God in us. We have an eternal life in us. We have a, the highest quality of life in us. Because Christ now dwells within, within us. That's the power of the gospel. If you understand this, this will bring uh, absolute blessings to you. And God wants you to have all the blessings. He's already paid for your blessings. He has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's how he's blessed us. He wants you to know that he loves you. This father wants you to know that he loves you. He cares for you. He's intimately aware of everything that you're going through. And he wants you to help you. But you've got to hear the word so that faith can come in your hearts and it can bring change to you. He wants you to know that he's paid for everything in life. He's paid for your sickness already. So if you're sick this morning, I want you to know that God has already paid for that through the blood of Christ, through the price that he paid on the cross. That is already accomplished through him for us. So healing is a forever settled subject. God has already done it for us. He wants us to know that we are in him. He wants us to know who we are. And this all is revealed through the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where it is revealed. This is what God wants you to know. So through the hearing of this transforming gospel, the gospel of grace, the Lord is constantly working miracles in our lives. God wants to do a miracle for you. How? Through this gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 verse 5 says, Therefore, he who supplies to the, the, the Spirit to the works of miracles and works of miracles amongst you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The God that does miracles around you, does he do it through your works? Is there anything that you can do to, to see a miracle happen in your life? No. He does it through the hearing of faith. God's going to do a miracle for you. And I want you to be ready this morning. God wants to do a miracle for you. He wants to do something in your life. He's going to do something that was, was, was impossible in previous seasons and previous times and even in your mind. And he's going to bring it to fruition. Why? Because the word of Christ is going to bring faith in you. And that faith is going to connect you to the miracle that you need this morning. So I want you to hear this word. Just before we start, let's just pray. Father God, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here, right here in our midst. Now here while I'm speaking, Lord, let my voice, let my tongue, let my mouth become as if it's the oracles of God releasing a word of power that will change people, that will bring a transformation in the minds of people, that will bring healing to those who need healing, that will bring restoration for, for, for marriages and relationships for those that need it in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That is on your word, that is on your, that is on your servants. And I pray this morning as we speak, Lord, let the power of God reveal God's heart to the people so that people can connect to the eternal life, eternal Zoe life, eternal God who loves us, who cares for us, and who wants us to have life and life in abundance. We pray this in the name of Jesus. 
and we thank for it. thank you for it. Amen. Amen. So you see, God wants to do something. The miracles that you receive has got nothing to do with what you can do or not do. It has got everything to do with what you hear. Therefore, this morning, listen to what you're going to hear at the, as I'm speaking this word. This word is an anointed word. This no word is anointed and pushed by the Holy Spirit to stir faith in your spirit so that when you believe you can connect to your miracle. God wants you to have this miracle. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for what God wants to do right now? This is his spirit working in us right at this time. He does, he does it by the hearing of the good news, the hearing of the gospel, and he wants you to hear this. So miracles can only happen when you hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of Christ. Our part is to hear his goodness, hear about God's love for us, hear about what God wants for us. And then faith will rise. His faith will rise from within us and will connect to that. If you will receive with meekness. Now listen, this is, a, this is the key. Receive with meekness the implanted word that is able, that is able, that is able. This word is able. Say it's able. This word is able to save your mind, your soul, your thoughts, your emotions. It is able to heal you. It is able to restore you. It is able to provide for you and all that you need. I want to say this word, who is a person in the beginning, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and it dwell amongst us. This word will bring change, radical change and transformation in your life. If you believe that, just say amen. That is the word that I believe God wants us to hear. He wants us to hear. God is able. He's able to save us. He's able to heal us. He's able to supply in all our needs. He's able to, to give you that breakthrough that you've been longing for. You've been struggling for years. But listen, God says, I am able. I am able. Hear my word. Faith is the source of God's action on mankind's behalf. When we hear the gospel of grace, God will on your behalf bring faith in your life. And your, that faith will connect to the word and that will bring the miracle in your life. It's his faith. It's not our faith. It's his faith that causes the miracles. And as you hear the word of Christ, simply allow the faith of God to rise within you, to believe what God is constantly doing. And he will release that miracle, that thing that you've been asking God for, that you've been lying before him and saying, God, please, would you intervene in this? God says, listen to my word and let my word stir the faith, my faith in you so that you will arise and connect to what you are destined to connect to. That's what God wants you to do. As part, uh, our part as believers is not, is not to transform the world. Our part as believers is simply to go into the world and to spread this gospel, the gospel of the good news of Christ, the gospel of grace into the world so that they, the gospel may bring the transformation. The word will transform you. The word will transform you by faith that he places within you. So the gospel is not just meant for the Jews, although it started in Jerusalem, but to G it went to Judea, uh, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, even right now, here where we are. That word is a powerful word. It's the power of God unto salvation. So Luke chapter 24, verse 47, it says, The prophetic scriptures... Now, what, what does it mean when they talk about the prophetic scriptures? In this sense, it means that what Christ would suffer, well, that he would die, that he would raise again. That was prophetically spoken by Isaiah. So the prophetic scriptures also conclude. What concludes? The fact that Christ died, raised, raised up from the dead and ascended into heaven. It concludes that proclaiming this message, proclaiming that Jesus died for you, that he rose from the dead, that he paid for all your sins and your sicknesses, that he made you righteous. All those things, they, they proclaim the message and it, they celebrate the authority and the meaning of his name. 
it will inevitably lead the humanity into co-knowing. What does it mean that this word will bring us into co-knowing? This word will bring you into a place where you understand, know as God knows about you. Know as God knows about you. Co-knowing what God knows about you. That's, that's what it means. And it will awaken us. Awa this word will awaken us, causing us to engage the full realization of the complete remission of sins. This word brings us to a place where we understand and know my sins are forgiven. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a son of God saved by grace. Hallelujah. I'm, the, I'm a son that was, was, was revealed to me by God's word. That is what I am. That is who I am. Remember the Bible says, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the earth. So what happened in here in Jerusalem, it will continue to happen. What happened in Jerusalem will continue to happen and, and it will continue to circle out like ripplings, becoming an unstoppable tsunami. This word is going to become an unstoppable tsunami, overwhelming the masses of humanity with the good news of their royal reign and of their redeemed identity and their innocence. This is what the word's going to bring. It's going to bring you to a place where you understand that you are royalty called to reign. It's going to bring you to a place of understand that you are that, that of your redeemed innocence. You are innocent. because Not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done on the cross. Because of the finished work. And it's going to bring you to a place of innocence where you understand your innocence and your redeemed identity what is my redeemed identity i am a son a son of the living god that's who i am that's who you are that's your redeemed identity you are not what the world says what what people may say people are so confused about their identity you are what god says you are you don't ask a chair chair what is your purpose you go ask the creator of the chair, what is the purpose of this chair? So you go to God, your father, from whom you are offspring, from whom you come. Then you go to him and ask him, Father, why am I here? Who am I? What am I? And he will tell you, you are my son, who I have begotten. You are my son, who I love whom I have given my life for. You are my son who means everything to me. That's what the father will say. So this gospel was beginning in Jerusalem, but it went all over the world. And throughout history, God is always ensuring that this gospel will, uh, will, will go even in hard times. It doesn't matter what the seasons are that we may be going through. I'm telling you, God will ensure that the gospel of grace will go forth. No matter what's happening in our world, no matter what's happening in your world, God is sovereign and he will arrange for this gospel of grace to reach every four of the four corners of the earth. This is the gospel that Jesus Christ has died for. That is the gospel that he is. So even in the pandemic, if you look at the pandemic, what happened? The church the church and the, and the ministries went online. There's no good thing in this world that would bring the church to a place where they would go out of their buildings into a place where they go online as I'm speaking now. No good thing in the world would have done that. Something bad had to happen for that to happen. But you know, even God even uses the bad stuff for His good. So what happened was, what they thought when they thought they stopped the churches, the churches went viral. There's something that God is doing that will never stop the working of His Holy Spirit and the spreading of the gospel. Nothing will stop the spreading of the gospel. The tsunami wave impact of this good news is the revelation of our redeemed identity and the innocence of our, and, and our righteousness before God as sons. That is the tsunami that God wants the world to know. 
Because the world is confused about identity. The world is confused about God and about themselves. They don't recognize God. And because they don't recognize God, they can't see himself themselves. Because you can only see yourself as you see him. When you see him now, it is like looking into a mirror. And you wonder why and how. But one day, what? when is the one day? The day that you recognize him as your savior. The day you recognize him as your genesis. That day you will look into the mirror and you will see him face to face. <laughs> For as he is, so are we in this world. Isn't that amazing? 1 John 4, 17. I pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be proclaimed all over the world. And this, this message will change people. We must... Uh, we must uh, and our own spirit of sonship, we must inherit what God wants us to have. So we are called as sons. We are called as, as sons and therefore God wants us to inherit. He wants to inherit. We are co-heirs with Christ and, and heirs of God, the Father. You see, we, we weren't saved to go to heaven. Many people think you're going to get saved just to go to heaven. Many people want to get out of this world and just go to heaven. Listen, you are not saved to go to heaven. You are saved to, so that, you're awake, so that your, your authentic identity could be awakened. That's why you are saved. You are saved to know that you're already seated with God in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. In a place of executive authority from where you live your life. From where you rule and reign. Now we do not call all the intercessors to pray like in the Old Testament. No, we have got an intercessor. In heaven that is interceding for us. He is the father of, our, of, of, of life. Jesus Christ is our intercessor. That is before the father. If there's time 24 hours out of a day. But there's no time in heaven. So he's constantly forever and ever and ever interceding for you and for me. And we think that we need intercessors to help God. You can't help God. He's already done it. It is finished. So last week I established that we are no longer infants. We saw that the word nephios is the word for an infant. But the moment you get to know the Father, the moment you get to know your own authentic identity, the moment you, you get saved or born again, call it what you want, that very moment you are not a nephios anymore. You are not a little child anymore. You are a son of God. You are a yuios, as the Greek says, of God. You are a son, which means a full-grown son of God. So that's very important to understand. So out the scriptures, when Paul preaches, when he preaches to the Jews, he talks about we. When he preaches to the Gentiles, he talks about you. So and then in Galatians 4 verse 3, he says, In the same way, when we were children, talking about the Jews, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now the Mirror Bible says this is exactly how it was with us. We were kidnapped as if in an infancy and confined to the state, to that state, through the law. An inferior mindset as a result of Adam's fall. So here's the thing. He's talking about Israel and he's saying we were subject to the elementary principles of the world, which means they were subject to the law. As children, as nephews, as little children, they were subject to the law. You see, a child needs discipline. A child needs order. So you've got to give a child discipline. And you've got to learn that child, give him some, some laws to, to abide by. But when you become mature, you don't have to give a mature man any this, uh, 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 laws, although some of them never grow up. I mean, but if you, a, a mature man, you don't need to give laws, say, don't do this, don't do this. They know they don't, shouldn't do that. I remember as, a, as when my daughter was, was uh, a small, she always challenged everything we did and said. So she would, we would say, do not touch that, uh, that uh, st the stove's plate because it's hot. It will burn you. So guess what? She will touch it. So she does it once. Now that she's mature and beautifully mature, 
she will not touch that, that stove's plate that is hot. Why? Because she knows. It's written in her. It's not something I have to tell her, don't do that. She knows the truth. The same with this. We, under the law, we were, the law was a custodian of us that ruled over us while we were little children. But now that we know him, things have changed. So the law was our guardian until Christ, Galatians 3.24, until Christ. So the law has a sell by date, until Christ. The law was our custodian until Christ, until. So until says there's a sell by date for the law. So the law was there until what? Until Christ came. The Jews were put under the law uh, and uh, as a guardian until Christ came. Now the law or the word law in the Greek means elementary principles. So the same word elementary principles is used in Hebrew 5.12 where it says, for though, for, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. The first principles here refers to the law of the Jews, which was their ABC to faith. That's what the law was. So children need rules and regulations and guide to guide them. But adults don't need them. They know the truth. They know the truth. So for 1,500 years, God put Israel under the custodian of the law until he sent his son. Now Galatians 4 verse 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive adoption as sons. You see in Galatians 4, 5, in the mirror says, But then the day dawned, the most complete culmination of time, the fullness of time. Everything that was predicted was concluded in Christ. The Son arrived, commissioned by the Father. His legal passport to the planet was His mother's womb. In a human body, exactly like ours, He lived His life, subject to the same scrutiny of the law. And his mandate was to secure the human race from the regime of the law of performance and announce the revelation of their new true sonship in God. Now our true state of sonship is realized again. Through who? Through Jesus Christ. It was not though as he arrived from, of, on a foreign planet. No, he came to his own, but his own did not recognize him. But to everyone who realizes their association in him, everyone that realizes that he's our father, convinced that he's their original life, that we stem from him. In them, God confirms that we are his offspring. The moment you refer, when you, when, you, when you believe that God is your father, God declares you are my offspring. These are they who discover their greatest, the, 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 their genesis. And their genesis is not in their mother and their father. Their genesis is in God the Father. I want you to know it. I don't care where you were born. Thank God for mothers and fathers that bring us up and love us and, and discipline us and show us the way and show us the light. But I'm telling you, you are not a result of your father and your mother. You were there before you were formed in your mother's womb. God already knew you. Jeremiah 1.5, God knew you intimately. The word became human being in Christ Jesus and we are his address. We are the address. Why? Because he lives in us. He resides in us. In Him we recognize our true beginning. If you want to know your true beginning, it is in Him that you will only recognize your true beginning. So the glory that Adam lost returns to us in fullness. Only grace can communicate this kind of complete context of the word to us. Only grace communicates that. So the word sons here is no more little boy 
or little children. But it's speaking about huios. It's talking about a mature son. Full grown son. So as grown sons, we have received <laughs> the spirit of sonship. Hallelujah. As a full grown son, we are conscious of the father's love that prepared an inheritance for us. That has given us a position of dignity. That loves us. Because of course love has fulfilled the law. Love fulfilled the law. Jesus is love. God is love. And he fulfilled the law. In Romans 8, 4, it says, The very righteousness promoted by the law, because the law certain had a certain righteousness, is now realized in us. That righteousness is now in us. We are the righteousness of God, of God in Christ Jesus. Our practical day-to-day -day life bears witness. To the Spirit's inspiration and not a fleshly domination. Now we are inspired by the Spirit. We are not dominated by the flesh anymore. In us. Under grace. This, this, this word that's in us. The very righteousness that's in us. So under grace we, 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 don't, we don't become lawless. We don't uh, do things that we don't do. Shouldn't do. No. Under grace. It is the Spirit that leads us. As you walk after the Spirit, you will fulfill the law. But supersede what the law expects of you. When you walk under grace, you will supersede the law. Because the law is here, but grace is there. I'll tell you why. And not only does the Bible say, the, the law says, do not steal. We do not steal. We have become generous in our giving we don't steal but the but grace takes us a level higher now we become generous in our giving don't steal we don't worry about stealing we are generous about giving only when you refine from we, we we also not only will you refrain from from adultery but you will love your spouse intimately don't do adultery. We love our spouses intimately. Brings us to a place where we will not walk into adultery. We love our spouses intimately. When people persecute you and when they curse you, you begin to pray for them and you bless them. Why? Because the Spirit of the Son says, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. That's the Spirit of Sonship. By our own effort, it is impossible to well, fulfill the law. No one can. No one can. Only Jesus could fulfill the law. And when we couldn't keep it, the, the commandment that says, love God with all your heart, your mind, with your, everything that is in you, Jesus started to love us in that way. And when he loved us in that way, we started to love. Why? Because he loved us first. He loved us first. James 2.10 says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. So that's the problem with the law. You can keep nine out of the ten. But when you make mistake with one, you it's just as good as you've, you've, you've failed the whole law. Why? Because the law is a composite whole. It is one. So if you, if you fail the one, you fail in everything. This is why it's important for us to know what uh, to know what Christ did for us on the cross to know the finished work to know that God has already established all these things for us because now we don't under the law anymore we are under grace and now under grace and the holiness we have a result of grace that goes far beyond anything keeping the law under grace we can go further than anybody keeping the law and <clears throat> Galatians 4 verse 6 says, And because you are sons of God, send forth the Spirit of He sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. As if a son, and, and if a son, then you're also an heir of God through Jesus Christ. So to seal our sonship, God has commissioned the Spirit of Sonship in us. And that spirit resonates 
Abba Father, cries out, Abba Father, in our hearts. And our innermost beings, we start to recognize Him as our true and authentic Father. Because the spirit of sonship is in us. Now I see my Father, God as my true, authentic Father. So the original life that the Father revealed in His Son, that same life conducts my life now. His life determines my life. His life determines what I do, how I live, how I think. His life determines my whole life. How did God put the spirit of sonship in us? How did he do it? The moment you believe that Jesus Christ in him and in his finished work, the very moment you were born again, you became biological sons of God. Actually, God reminded you what you have always been. You were lost but now you found, but you've never lost your value. The lost son, the lost coin, the lost, the coin never lost its value. The lost coin never lost its value. The lost son, meaning that he, although he was lost, meaning that he already belonged to someone. You already belonged to someone before you were found. And he found us actually before we was lost. That is the awesomeness of God. Romans 8 15 says for he didn't we did not receive the spirit of slavery to go back into fear you've received the spirit of adoption of sons slavery is such a poor substitute for sonship now living under the law is to be a slave it's such a poor substitute for sonship they are opposites the one leads forcefully through fear that's the law, forcefully through fear. If you're not going to do this, I'm going to hit you. If you're not going to, God's going to kill you. Moses didn't, didn't uh, uh, um, bring a knife to his, to his little boy uh, by uh, circumcision. And God nearly killed him. His wife had to step in. God nearly killed him. That's what the one rules forcefully through fear. That's the law. But sonship responds fondly to the father. Isn't that awesome? We respond fondly to the Father. We are not slaves of a taskmaster, which is, which is the Lord. No, we are gifted with the spirit of sonship. God gave it as a gift. Now we engage the tenderness of our effective, affectionate Father. And we call Him Abba, my Father, my Father. Isn't that amazing? So when we own the spirit of sonship, which God has placed in us as a gift, we will experience true feeling of being a son, being loved, being cared for by God, knowing that God will look after me. He's got my back. He has me in his hands. The spirit of Jesus now resides in us. And that spirit cries out in us, calling Father, Abba, Father. That is what the spirit of sonship, the spirit of Christ in me. Because we are his offspring, we qualify to be heirs of the Father and co-heirs of Jesus Christ. God himself is our portion. God is your portion. We are co-inheritors of, of Jesus Christ. Now Romans 8.15 says, For we did not give us the spirit of sonship to fall back into fear. See, God doesn't want you to fall back into the law. The Lord led us forcefully through fear. Sonship responds fondly to Abba Father. The spirit of sonship responds to the Father. I don't have to bring a stick to bring it into, into alignment. His love and His spirit aligns me with whatever I hear my Father say that I speak. Whatever I see my Father do that I do. The King James Bible says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear again. To fear again. This referred to the old covenant. God, the, the spirit of bondage is in the old covenant. They were under those rules and regulations. And they feared God because, because there, there was consequences in the old, under the old covenant. The new covenant, God brings us through love. Now that law is in us. Christ is in us. The spirit of adoption is in us. The spirit of sonship is in us. You receive the spirit of sonship. It's the greatest, uh, uh, greatest gift that God can give you is the spirit of sonship. 
We, know, we may know all the names of God, but you know what? The biggest name that Jesus came to reveal, as I told you, is the name Father. He wants you to know him as Father. He wants you to call him Father. It is time for the spirit of sonship to be exercised more and more and more in our lives. This, the, verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It bears witness with our spirit. So we are sons of the living God. And, and he echoes in us, Abba, Abba. The spirit of sonship echoes, Abba, my father, my father. Listen, if you believe this word, and you feel the stirring of faith here this morning, and you don't know the Father in this way, right now in this moment, that faith in you is there to connect you to the, this eternal Father, to your eternal Father, your authentic Father, who is your Genesis. He wants to show His hand to you. He wants to heal your body. He wants to save you. He wants to care for you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to do all those things for you. But you need to hear the word and let His faith in you connect you right where you are. Right where you are. Father, in the name of Jesus, as faith is rising up in those that hear my voice, those that hear the, the sound of your spirit right now, as faith is stirred in the spirits. Now, Father, I thank you for healing every sick body. Now, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that the spirit of sonship cries in us. Abba, Father, fondly cries out to you. Father, my Father, my Father. Thank you, Lord, for healing us. Thank you for the finished work of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that what Christ established for us on the cross is now established in those that hear my voice in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are the provider for those who are in need of provision. Right now, Lord, thank you for providing in all our needs according to your riches in glory. You are our Father, already established in the finished work of Christ. It is paid for. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we can believe that you are the son of the living God. That we can believe that Abba is our father. And I feel the spirit of sonship coming to me. Because God is not somewhere up there anymore. God now in me. Emmanuel God with us. Thank you Jesus for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your spirit. I pray now let the spirit of sonship grab a hold of every person hearing my voice. And let their spirits cry out, Abba, Father, my Father, my Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us. I hope this word stirred you. And I believe that God's going to do miracles. And if, if, if there's some of you that have been touched by this word, please write it. Write, write to us. We will write back to you. Thank you for all your beautiful uh, time that you've been giving to listen to this word. May God bless you and may he um, lead you and, and prosper you in all things as, he, as your soul prospers. God loves you and we love you. Looking forward to being with you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen.